welcome uh, everybody who is from Central. And if you're not from Central, we want to welcome you in to the Word today. Uh, I'm excited to share what I really feel like is a message um, from the Holy Spirit today. Last week, Pastor Larry shared a message um, about the Holy Spirit. And, and getting to know the Holy Spirit. And, and we can not only know about the Holy Spirit, but we can know the Holy Spirit intimately and, and He can become our hero. And I kind of want to follow on a little bit from where He left off uh, last week. I want to talk about the new thing that the Holy Spirit is doing. But I'm just excited that you're in here with us today. Uh, I want you to know that as a church, as Central, we're alive and we're kicking. We haven't shut down. We're moving forward. We're pressing in to all of the things that, that God is doing in these uncertain times right now. And, uh, and I just love that we've actually grown as a church. You know, we have more groups um, than we have ever had before. We have more people in groups connecting uh, through Zoom in our homes and in our kitchens and staying connected that way. And I just want to encourage you, if you're not in a group, get into a group. It is the life source, the lifeblood of Central. And if you want to stay connected and to meet new people and be challenged, but also to be encouraged and lifted up, can I just um, encourage you, please get into a group. It's just such a good thing to do. And so uh, I love that even though we had lots of plans for 2020, um, this COVID-19 has taken us by surprise. But I love that it hasn't taken God by surprise. It hasn't taken the Holy Spirit by surprise. He's not shocked that this has happened. But in the midst of this, we can uh, turn back to God. And, and my prayer is that during this whole time that your faith and your relationship with God has been deepened, that you're not too distracted by all of the screens and everything that's going on and the news and Netflix and Prime and Hulu and all of these different things that we can get addicted to and put our trust and our focus on. But I really hope that in this season, your relationship with God has deepened because I fundamentally believe that, that we believe a God who wants to partner with us. Um, right there in the beginning, God creates Adam. And the first thing he asks Adam to do is to name the animals. And is that because God couldn't name the animals or didn't know what to call them? Well, obviously not. Um, why was he asking Adam to do it? Well, because we serve a God who wants to be in relationship with us, but not just in relationship. He actually wants us to partner with him in accomplishing his mission. And so uh, I pray that you're partnering with God, that you're coming to him. And, and, and I pray that you come out of this season uh, refreshed and empowered. You know, how are you, what are going to be the long lasting effects of this on you personally? Are you coming out of this refreshed or empowered or are you coming out of it tired and anxious? Are you, are you coming out of it knowing God on a deeper level or are you coming out of it with just more conspiracy theories? Now, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with a conspiracy theory, but but so what? You know, it's, it's not going to move you. I really believe that if people were more focused on their own calling, on their own journey, on listening to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to them, they'd have less time to talk about uh, what politicians are doing right and what they're doing wrong and what the leaders should be doing and what churches should be doing or shouldn't be doing. If we were more focused on what God has called us to, we would be less critical of what other people are doing um, because it would hone us in. And so I pray in this season of adversity that you're coming to know God, that you're partnering with with him, that you're not tired. Proverbs 24.10 says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength was small. I, I like how the message version says it. It says, if you faint in the day of adversity, there wasn't much of you to begin with anyway. And so don't faint in these days. Come on, let's press in, deepen your faith with God. I, I pray that the lasting impacts are going to be significant in a good way. People keep saying, you know, these are unprecedented times. Never before in the history has this happened. Well, 
I mean, yeah, but, but nah, not, not really. I mean, um, the world has gone through economic crisis before. The world has seen plagues before. But, but people have gotten through it, that they've managed not just to get by, but to prosper and to find a way. And, and you see it time and time again in the Bible. There's economic crises, there's crises, there's plagues, there's all sorts of things happening. But God has a way of partnering with us to bring us through. And so I'm really just believing that that is going to happen for us. We're almost at the end of it. It won't last forever. Uh, we're going to be in here soon. And so uh, uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians, um, he says, for this, this light affliction, uh, he calls it, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us for mar far more exceeding and eternal glory. So, so in Paul's words, what we're going through right now is a light affliction in comparison to, to the glory and exceeding goodness that God wants to bring about. In the message version, he says it's small potatoes. Uh, and so sometimes you just have to look at God's perspective and go, okay, this is small potatoes. We're going to get through this because he wants to lavish, lavish us with a celebration. And, uh, and people keep coming up to me and they're asking, you know, when are we going to meet again? Well, when are we going to go back to church? When is church going to start up again? Uh, here's the problem with that question. When you ask that question, what you're telling me is you don't know what church is. The church never shut down. It's, it, it may have stopped meeting together for a moment, but that doesn't mean church isn't happening. And maybe the Holy Spirit is wanting to do a new thing. Maybe he's wanting to speak something fresh into our lives. Maybe he's trying to get us to understand that church was never about a meeting. It was never about an event. That church is a body of people committed to following Jesus Christ the way that he lived his life in love and in peace and in reconciliation and forgiveness and in mercy and in grace and all those other things that, that, that know God and partner with Him and His Spirit. And it's a body of people that outwork their life. It's not, the church is not a meeting on Sunday. And I'm looking forward to when we can meet together again and build each other up. But at the same time, come on, let's keep pressing forward in our lives, which leads me on to what I want to talk to you about today. So we have our theme and it's heroes. And, and today I'm going to talk to you about Samuel a little bit. And, and I'm going to kind of jump through. We've got a lot of scripture that I want to move through today. And I'm going to jump through some, some highlights in his life. And what I want you to see is what God does through Samuel and what the Spirit does through Samuel. In the Old Testament, you have spiritual concentration. So, so in the Old Testament, you'll have a prophet, and the prophet was generally the spokesperson for the whole nation. Or, or you'd have a king, or, or you have a, a, a leader, or very few people that the Spirit would come upon, rest upon, and move through. But when it comes to the New Testament, it's not spiritual concentration, but it's spiritual dispersion. And so, so everybody has access to the same spirit, to the same power. That's why Jesus can say, you know, uh, greater things you will do and you will accomplish after me because it's, it's in his strength and in his power that we're doing things. And, and so we have to understand that that is how the spirit worked in the Old Testament, but there was a new thing that happened in the New Testament. And sometimes we can be resistant to the new thing I think God is trying to accomplish through us. We can fight against it. And, and one, of the, one of the reasons that we stop looking to the new thing is because we're so focused on the old thing. We're looking at what God used to do and we're expecting him to do the same thing in the future. Uh, and that's why Hebrews, it talks about, hey, you, you keep looking for God in the law, but the law is never going to satisfy you nor sustain you. There is a new thing that the Spirit is doing. It's no longer spiritual concentration. It is the Holy Spirit for whoever asks. Whoever receives, the Holy Spirit is going to move through and do something with it. 
So, so there is a shift. There's a new thing. Now, it, it kind of looks like the old thing because it's the same spirit and he's partnering with people. But it's a whole new thing because it's not just select people. It is anybody who asks to receive the spirit. And, and so uh, the, the writer of Hebrew is challenging them. Hey, look, stop looking to the old thing. There is a new thing that's happening and we have to get excited about the new normal. And I think in our age right now today, we've got to get excited. We've got to listen in to the Holy Spirit again. What is it you want to say? What is it you're leading us to do? And remember, it's the Holy Spirit that leads us. I know a lot of people who like to bring the Holy Spirit with them wherever they go. And it's like they have little Jesus in their pocket. And every once in a while, they'll pull Jesus out of their pocket and ask him what to do. That's not really the idea of the Christian walk. The idea of the Christian walk is not that we bring Jesus with us, but that we're following the Spirit. So, so Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing, and I only say what the Father tells me to say. So, so, so the Father, Abba Father, God, leads Jesus in his conversation, leads him in uh, uh, the, the way that, that he reconciles people together, leads him in which miracles to perform and how to perform them. It governs his life. He, he doesn't just pull um, God out of his pocket whenever it's convenient for him. And so God, I believe, is wanting to do a new thing. Think of it this way. You have the Israelites, and, and they're coming out of Egypt. There's been the plagues, and, and Pharaoh finally releases them. And they're coming out of Egypt, but their backs are up against a, a sea, the Red Sea. And, and on one side, they've got the sea. They've got the water in front of them. And on the other side, they've got an army in chariots coming up to attack them. And what, are the, what happens? God performs a miracle. He separates the waters. And you've got a wall of water on this side, a wall of water on this side. And God delivers them literally through the waters. But, but then what happens in Isaiah? He says that, look, uh, I'm going to do a new thing in the wilderness. Because after the, after the Red Sea, they end up in the wilderness. And, and he says, I'm going to provide for you in the wilderness. Well, what is it they need in the wilderness? Well, they, they needed water. So, so in Isaiah 43, it says there's going to be springs that are going to come up in the wilderness. So, 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 so think of it like this. What was once their barrier is now their salvation. Water which prevented them and stopping them from moving forward is now what's going to sustain them in their life. And that's the beautiful thing about what God wants to do is he will take your barriers. He will take the things that are going to stop you in life and he will use them for your good. I, I really believe that, that he takes our shame and he turns it into grace. He takes that abuse that you suffered and he turns it into power and a testimony for your life. God has a way of taking that thing that was going to threaten you and that thing that was going to kill you and that thing that was going to prevent you from moving forward. And he has a way of using it to bless your life because it's a new thing he's going to do. It, it, it wasn't another parting of the sea that they needed. Some of them would have been looking for that miracle again, but that's not what was happening. God wanted to do a new thing. And I want to say this, whatever is next is best. Whatever is next is best. Sometimes I think we have a very uh, rose-tinted glasses about the past. Well, we tend to do one of two things, actually. Either we have rose-tinted glasses and you'll hear people say, oh... The past was so much better. Church used to be so much better. The spirit just used to, used to move and we used to worship for three hours on end. Oh, I was so, back in my day, you would never see young people talking to adults that way. Oh, back in my day, people knew a work ethic. Oh, back in my day. And it's like we have these rose tinted glasses. But the reality is those same people were complaining about their day in their day. <laughs> and all they've done is they've taken their complaining and they've shifted it into the future. And so sometimes we can look at the past, but if we were to be really honest, we look at it and we say it was so wonderful, but if we were to go back, we would go, actually, it wasn't that wonderful. It wasn't that great. Actually, when I go back, I complained a lot. 
And so you have the people who, who complain about the, the present because they love the past so much. And then you just have people who complain about the present because it's here all the time and, and, and they don't want to move forward and they don't like it and they don't like anything. So some people have rose-tinted view of the past and other people just can't stand the past at all. And, and so we can be constant complainers and whiners. And, but here's the thing, whatever is next is always best. I get young people asking me, what's it like to be in your 30s? And I say, it's great. <laughs> Honestly, it's just like being in your 20s, but without the insecurities and with more money. Um, and, and so sometimes we can worry about getting older and our body, you know, doing weird things and all of a sudden hurting. But if you talk to somebody who's older, at least somebody who's wise, they'll say that life just gets better and better. It gets more fun. God adds more things to your life. He adds children. He, he adds better opportunities. He adds more travel to your life. And so life should be enjoyed. And whatever is next is better. And so we have to look at the new thing that God is doing. Let me just quickly say this. We honor the past. We respect the past but we can never go back there. And I don't think the Spirit wants to bring us back. I think He wants to move us forward. And there might be elements from the past that He wants to bring into the present, but ultimately, it's a new thing that God is always doing. So let's have a look um, at second at Samuel's life and what we can learn um, through Samuel and through the history really of Israel. Samuel is a young man. Now, the priest of uh, Israel is a man called Eli. Eli has two wicked sons who are stealing from the temple. But what happens is that, that Samuel uh, is born to Hannah, and Hannah makes a promise with God and says, look, if you give me a son because I'm barren, barren I promise that, that, that he will be uh, your uh, instrument, that, that you, I'm going to offer him back up to you. I'm going to give him back to you. And so God blesses Hannah with a child called Samuel. And so she gives Samuel back to the Lord. And so Samuel ends up in Eli's house. And as a young man, he begins to hear from God. And God, in his, in his spirit, in his concentration, settles on Samuel the prophet. And Samuel the prophet is extremely unique. It says about Samuel that not one of his words fell to the ground. Imagine that. Imagine not one of your words ever falling to the ground. That, that every single time you prophesied, it was 100% accurate. That everything you said was truth. Everything you said was God's word. That's what's said about Samuel the prophet here. Now, Samuel grows up. And as he's becoming an older man, the nation of Israel are getting tired of not having a king. They're getting tired of this cycle of violence and then oppression and then liberation and violence, oppression, liberation. They're just done with it. And Samuel's becoming an old man. And Samuel's sons, like Eli's sons, are also wicked. So here's what happens in 1 Samuel 8. It says this, So all the elders of Israel gathered together, and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. It's interesting, isn't it? So God pulls them out of Egypt. He pulls them out of this oppressive governing structure. And he says, I want to do a whole new thing here. I want to do a new thing through you guys, where it's not just about building up your armies and your assets and then conquering all the other tribes, but I actually want to use you, Israel. I want to use you to be a blessing to all of the other nations. You're not going to look like the other nations. You're not going to sound like the other nations. You're not going to be like the other nations. You're not going to govern like the other nations. I want to do a new thing through you. But it's as though they're so resistant to the new thing that God is doing. They're just saying, I don't, we don't want these battles anymore. We want somebody to fight our battles. Just give us a king and then we can be like all the other nations. Um, but when they said this, I'm going to read on from verse 6 here. Give us a king to lead us. This displeased Samuel. So Samuel was irritated. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but it is me they have rejected as their king. As they have done so from the day I brought them out of Egypt, forsaking me and serving other gods. Um, and so now listen to me. But he says, fine, 
God says, fine, give them a king. It's not you they're rejecting, Samuel. It's me as their king they're rejecting. Give them what they want. But he says, but warn them solemnly and let them know what, that, what the king who will reign over them will claim as his own rights. So, so God is saying, fine, you want to reject me like you've done since you've come out of Egypt. You don't want to accept the new governance that I'm trying to bring in. You don't want to accept the hard work of having to listen to the spirit and following in his footsteps. Fine. You, you want to look like all the other nations. That's fine. But here's a warning. And this is the warning they get. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who are asking him for a king. And he said, This is what the king will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and he will make them serve with his chariots and his horses and they will run in front of his chariots and some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow the ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war for equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers and the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves will belong to him and his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage to give to his officials. He will take your donkeys for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and your cells will become his slaves. Just notice the language here of chariots and slaves and taking. What does this remind you of? This reminds you of a place that they escaped from. And he's going to take you yourselves and you will become slaves. And on that day, You will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. (laughs) That is harsh. But what's more incredible, right? So they've just got this entire list. You're going to take your daughters, your sons. I'm going to take your land. I'm going to take your flocks, a tenth of all of it. I'm going to make you slaves. And then when you finally call out to release me from this oppression, I'm going to say, you should have listened to me. What do the people say in response to Samuel's prophetic word from the Lord? But the people refused to listen to Samuel. They said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us, to get out before us and to fight our battles. So, so we're gonna, I'm going to take all of this from you. He's going to take your lands. He's going to take your crops. He's going to take your donkeys. He's going to put your women to work. He's going to put the best of your men to work. He's going to take tenth of your, all of your wealth. He's eventually going to make you slaves. And then when you cry out for help, he's not going to listen and neither is the Lord. Yeah, I want that. That's what I want. Nah, give us a king because I don't want to fight the battles anymore. We want to look like all the other nations. Isn't it incredible what happens when we stop engaging with the new thing that the Spirit is want to do, that the Spirit wants to do through us, that the Spirit wants to outwork in your life, your life, not my life. Don't be concerned about my walk. Don't be concerned about Pastor Larry's walk. It's your life, how he's going to build you up. And here's the thing about God. If you resist him, He's going to be gracious enough to say, okay, I'll give you what you want. But I want you to understand that what you want is not going to pan out the way that you think it's going to pan out. This is eventually going to hurt you. And that's why Samuel is so irritated because he's just like, they just lack so much imagination. They lack all this drive. They lack this ability to see the new thing the Spirit wants to do in our midst. All they want is the old again. You can take the people out of Egypt, but he says, ever since they've been out, I haven't been able to get the Egypt out of them. And so the Spirit is wanting to do this new thing, but, but the people were resistant. And it's like, nah, just take me back to the old. Give us a king. Make us look like everybody else. Jesus insisted that there was a new kingdom coming and that his kingdom wasn't going to look like other kingdoms, that this kingdom wasn't built on power and dominance and manipulation and competition But this new kingdom was fundamentally built on completely different principles. So Samuel, as you can understand and you can imagine, is incredibly frustrated and disappointed. Fine, give them what they want. But here's the thing. Samuel still has to go and anoint the king because God has said, do it. And so Samuel, even though he's frustrated and irritated, even though he's doing something that he knows will harm Israel, he's giving them what they want. And so uh, God leads him to anointing a young man called Saul. 
And Saul is described as head and shoulders above everybody else, that there wasn't a man in the land that was more handsome than him. And, and so it, it takes a bit of time to describe his physical appearance. It takes a bit of time to describe what he looked like. And so here is Samuel, and he's anointing Saul. And, and you can just imagine all of his hopes are in this man. Please don't fail me. Please don't let me down. Uh, uh, please lead the people well. He's encouraging, he's prophesying, he's anointing him with oil. But as you follow on in the story, Saul disobeys God. Saul disobeys Samuel directly. Saul, although he does very well in the beginning, ultimately he was so self-absorbed and so insecure that he was always looking for favor with the people and not with God. And that was ultimately his downfall, that he was looking to appease the people and not to do what the Lord had commanded him to do. And then that's where you get that famous line. Samuel comes up and he confronts Saul and he says, does the Lord delight in uh, sacrifice as much as he delights in obedience? Obedience is far more purposeful and meaningful to God than sacrifice could ever be. And so Saul fails. And, and, and it says um, that, that, that Samuel was grieving over it that he was disappointed in 1 Samuel 15 and says, until the day Samuel uh, died, he didn't go and see Saul again. And Samuel mourned for him. So he just felt it. He felt the brokenness that the people had abandoned God. And now, and now the king that, that he had anointed, that he has given credit and credence to, had failed God. And, and there's just this brokenness about him. And, and, and Samuel is mourning. And it even says that God regretted make, uh, giving Saul power, uh, making him king over Israel. And so, so Samuel goes away and he's living in the land of disappointment. He's living in the land of regret. He's living in the land of feeling like he's a failure. But then God breaks in and does something new. In Samuel 16, here's what the Lord says. He says, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way because I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. And here's the thing. Sometimes we're in such disappointment looking at the past, look at what could have been, should have been, would have been. And we're mourning over it and we're grieving over it. Over it, and there's a season to do that. There is a season where it is perfectly legitimate, and biblical, and God given to grieve and don't let anybody tell you any different. That is totally fair. There are some disappointments in your life, the expectations that weren't met. And even in this passage, God grieved along with Samuel. But there comes a point where God breaks into Samuel's life and he says, how long? How long are you going to stay broken? How long are you going to stay disenfranchised? You're stuck in the old. You're stuck looking at the past. You're stuck in your disappointment but I'm trying to do a new thing. I'm already ahead of you and I need you to catch up. I need you to follow me into the new thing that I'm birthing here because I'm excited. There is a young man. There is a young man I want you to go and see. And so here's what Samuel does. He goes and he has this whole pretense about sacrifice because he's worried about Saul killing him. And so he meets with Jesse and there he is. Imagine this, none of his words have fallen to the ground until Saul failed. Now it's like, I'm a failure. My ministry is a failure. How could people ever trust me again? This is uh, everything that I, I put my weight behind and prayer behind. It all fell apart. It was all decimated. My reputation is gone. And so he meets Jesse and then he meets the first son. He says, that's got to be him. That's got to be him. Look at him. He's tall. He's strapping. And God says, no, that is not the man. You keep looking, Samuel, at the old way of doing things. I'm not looking at the appearance anymore. I don't care how tall he is. I don't care how handsome he is. That's not what I'm after. I'm after something a little bit deeper. Try again. And can you imagine the insecurity in Samuel? It's like, I got it wrong again. Here's all this failure. And I'm trying to get up and fill my uh, horn with oil. And I'm trying to do this again. But now I've just failed. And it's like God's saying, keep going. Keep pressing in. I'm doing a new thing. Are you listening to me? Can you hear? And he looks at the next sign. He goes, it's not him. He looks at the next son, it's not him. And he's working his way through until there are no sons anymore. And, and can you imagine at that point, he's like, did I get it wrong? Did I hear wrong? I'm looking at all of this and God is saying, no, 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 but there are no more sons. He turns to Jesse and he says, do you have any more sons? Yes, I have my youngest. He's out tending the sheep. He says, bring him. 
And, and it's amazing that when the Bible describes David, it's very different to how he describes Saul. Saul is tall, head and shoulders above everybody else. T Saul is strong. Saul is a natural looking leader. But it says, Sam, um, it says that David was short. It said he was healthy and he had bright eyes. And so there's something about the health of his life that God was more interested in. There was something about the keenness and the sharpness of his eyes. We say the eyes are the windows to the soul that God was interested in. God was interested in his heart. He was trying to birth a new thing. And the question was, was Samuel brave enough to pick himself up again? Are you brave enough to pick yourself up again? Are you brave enough? Maybe you're really comfortable right now. Maybe life is really sweet and things are good and cash flow is good and all of my kids are good and business is booming for me. Maybe you're in that stage of life and here's my challenge to you. And it's the same challenge to somebody who's struggling and in pain and disappointed and disenfranchised. Same challenge. Are you still following the Holy Spirit? Are you still tuning in to the new thing that he wants to birth in your life. Sometimes I think we think of our walk with God as this really, really small tightrope. And if we get one foot wrong on this tightrope, then that's it. We've failed. Then I'm off my purpose. I'm off my path. But what if your path was less like a tiny, tiny, narrow step? What if it was more like your purpose was like a wide, wide, expansive ocean? And in order to hit the ocean, I could head this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, or this way. But guess what? I'm still going to get wet. I'm still going to reach my purpose. Maybe you make mistakes. Maybe you fall over. Maybe you take a different path. Maybe you take a way that was unexpected. Maybe you have a falling and, and you pivot and you change direction. But I still believe if we're following the Holy Spirit, if we're listening to his call, even though we mess up, even though we get a little bit turned from side to side, if we're heading in the general direction of the Holy Spirit, you're going to get wet. You're going to land into his purpose and his calling and his destiny for your life. So we have a collective newness about what God is trying to do in the church, but I believe there's a personal one as well. And so I have a couple of quick questions for you, um, four questions today. And these are for you guys to discuss in your groups. Um, so spend some time with your groups and talk these over. Go into depth and, and just allow the Holy Spirit to bring some things up. Samuel was an incredible hero. And I, I, and I think what was really the mark of his life was his willingness just to continue being led by the Spirit and to be obedient to God's Word. What good is it if you hear God, but you're not obedient to him? God will keep saying the same thing over and over again until you do the last thing he told you to do. So here's a couple questions for you. Number one, what does your self-talk sound like? I was talking to a youth uh, pastor, of my, uh, a friend of mine, who's a youth pastor. And uh, he said, on average, we can talk about 150 odd words a minute, which is, I don't know, just a little over two a second. Um, but when we close our mouths and we talk in our minds, we can talk anywhere between six to 800 words in a minute. And in this season where we have a bit more time to ourselves, where it's a little bit quieter or it's a little bit more lonely, I think there is a self-chatter which is endless, an endless ream and stream going on all the time. And so my question to you is, what does your self-chatter sound like? Are you glorifying the past that wasn't even real? Are you complaining about the past and the present? Um, or is there a different kind of self-talk where you're saying, God, help me tune into you. What's my path? What's my destiny? What's the next step for me, Father God? Even if it is a step into the unknown, I'm going to be willing to step out in this. So what does your self-talk sound like? Second question is, are you a complainer? <laughs> and be honest. 
um, and maybe allow somebody close in your life to answer the question and don't take offense when you hear it. Do you find yourself complaining when there's really no need to be? Um, I remember there's been a number of times uh, uh, I've talked about tennis quite a lot from stage and, uh, and sometimes I get a bit moody and grumpy that I'm losing tennis and, uh, and I can lose perspective. Sometimes I can lose perspective that I'm outside, that I'm with friends, that the sun is shining, that I have the freedom and the liberty to play sports, but I get so narrowed down into complaining about losing that I lose out on all the wonderful things that God has given me and all the gifts he's given me right here and now. So are you a complainer? Question number three, is there anything from your past that you need to let go of? And here's the thing, maybe it's a bad thing that you need to begin to loosen your grip on, but maybe it's a good thing. Maybe there are good seasons in your life, but those seasons have now finished and you need to move on from those. And I promise you, if you move on, although those seasons were good, God has got something better for you. He never takes away that which is good without giving that which is better. And he never takes away that which is better without giving that which is best. Okay? So there can be, summer is a great season. I love summer. But it finishes. And it leads into a different kind of season. And so sometimes good seasons end, oftentimes bad seasons end, but they do end. And we have to be willing to look at the new season of our life. And then question number four is, how can you begin to partner with the Holy Spirit? Just like Samuel, how can you tune in to what God is doing? How can you move through your disappointments or your complaints or whatever it is and say, Spirit, refresh me in this season. I wanna come out of this full. I wanna come out of this whole. I wanna come out of this knowing you better, having a deeper relationship with you, partnered with you, Father God. I don't just wanna carry you around when it's convenient, but I wanna follow you diligently. I want to know what your voice sounds like. And so my brothers and sisters, I pray that you would be challenged today. Um, but I really pray that, that you would deepen your relationship with God. It's not about religion. It's not about achieving a standard. Uh, grace is received. It's not earned. And so receive it today. And so Father God, would you pray with me? I just pray for everybody right now, whether they're going through a tough season or whether they're going through a good season. Lord, just like the prayer that, that Jesus prayed, we, we want to do your will, that, that not my will be done, but your will be accomplished in this season. And so be with us and speak clearly to us, Father God. May we have a new vision, a new imagination about what it is you want to achieve. Lord, may we come to know church as a far more expansive and open and liberating idea than we've ever had in our minds before, Lord. May it become true in our heart that we understand that we are the new kingdom that you are ushering in and we can be a part of bringing that to fruition, that we can bring that into the light today. And so, Lord, be with everybody who's watching this and all of the lives that they are going to impact and to touch. May his face shine upon you. Have a wonderful, fantastic weekend. Thank you so much for inviting us into your homes. I can't wait to be meeting here with you again. But until then, have a blessed weekend. Take care, Central.